Okay, so now we're going to continue where we left off um, by giving you this really good sense of reconstructive memory and some of the errors that it can cause. Um, let's do it. All right, so week five, lecture four, remembering what wasn't. I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, this is going to be a little quick one. It's, it's mostly going, the purpose of this is to have you actually feel um, memory and some of the errors that can cause. Um, so we're going to start right away with a memory test. So I gave you that list of words to remember at the end of the last lecture. Here's a new list of words. I want you to answer two questions for each of these words. Uh, and so if you have a sheet of paper or something like that, I would ask that you actually um, write down your answers to these questions. For each word, I would like you to answer first, was this word one of the ones I asked you to remember? Yes or no? Then, on a 10-point scale, how sure are you? Are you sure that this was um, on the list or not? Even with a no, I'm sure it was not, I'm sure it was. So take a moment and do that for these words. Don't mind me, I'll just hang in. Okay, if, if you're not done, pause the video, um, and, but I'm gonna carry on. So pause as long as you need to do that and then continue on. All right, so how good is your memory? The words in green were on the list. So hopefully for each of those, you said, yes, it was on the list. Um, and, well, how sure were you? So what you should do is take those 10 sure numbers, sorry, those 10, those four, the four numbers for those three, write them down, and, and if you want, take an average of them. Add them up and divide by four. See what your average confidence was. Now, the black words were um, not on the list. Um, and they were really different from the words on the list. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, but they were not on the list. So uh, hopefully for most of those you said no. And you can look at your confidence for those if you'd like. But the really interesting ones are the ones in red. These items were not on the list. So one question is for how many of these did you say yes? And my expectation is that at least for one of these three you said yes. If that's true, then look at that one that you said yes to and look at how confident you were. And is it possible that you were just as confident as for that one as you were for the ones in green? Okay. What's going on here? So I'm hoping at least for some of you, you did say yes and you were actually pretty confident and you were wrong. Those words were not on the list. How can you be remembering something that never occurred? Fascinating. Here was the list. Okay, and the green, I'm showing you the words that were just included on the previous test. Let's, let's go back for a second and look at this word, thief. Thief was not on the list, but steal, rob, crime, robber, cop, and gun were all on the list. These are all words related to thievery. Um, they are all what's called strong semantic associates of the word thief. They have a very similar meaning. So even though thief was not actually presented, the claim is it was kind of there. We presented all these items that were related to thievery and that in your brain, when you're trying to reconstruct that memory, the, the concept of thief could be very active, enough to make you believe it was actually prese uh, presented in the list. Over here, the critical word they were all related to was anger, fear, emotion, wrath, temper, rage. Well, calm's kind of the opposite. But again, these all kind of imply an anger kind of emotion for lack of a better word. And so a lot of people, if you present a bunch of words related to anger, but not anger, they will think anger was on the list. It would fit, right? It's kind of like it 
Yeah. And these ones are all related to the word fruit. So again, the claim is by cleverly setting up these words, you can actually make people remember things that were never presented and not only do they remember those things, but their confidence in the memory is very high. So sometimes we remember things that never occurred with high confidence. Now, in the real world, you've run into this. You, you've had an argument with a friend or a spouse about something silly usually. Um, maybe you say something like, well, what did you think of the green paint that that guy had on his wall when we were visiting last week? And the other person might say, green? It wasn't green, it was red. And you say, no, it was green. No, it was red. So now you have two people arguing about a memory of some event, both extremely sure that they're correct, and obviously they cannot both be correct. So at least one, if not both of those people, is highly confident about something that didn't occur. That's memory. Okay, the reconstruction can produce a memory that, that is false, and we can be very confident in it. That's what makes memory simultaneously both, both so fascinating, but also a little scary, again, when it's used in things like legal context to put somebody in jail. So it's fascinating. Um, nice little demo. Okay, um, so quick little lecture. I just wanted you to feel that false memory, and I wanted to hopefully produce a false memory in you. But here's some really great videos. I, I, I went a little shorter on the lecture because I really want you to check out some of these. Um, Loftus again talking about false memories. Here's a, a video that, that goes into a little bit more detail about how these false memories can be created. And this last one, check this out because it's really poignant. Um, there's, there was a time when a lot of people who had um, psychological issues of some sort would go to therapy and the therapist would explore these issues with them and it was almost like a false memory paradigm. They, the therapist might think maybe this person was abused as a child. So they wouldn't actually say that because in therapy if you directly challenge somebody's um, traumatic memory they often get defense, defensive about it. So instead you talk around it. You know, kind of like we never said the word thief but we said everything related to it. And sometimes people in these therapeutic situations have what's called a recovered memory. They suddenly remember some, some very traumatic experience, like being sexually abused as a child, uh, which is already you know, scary. But then they will sometimes charge people, say an uncle or something that, that did this, and then subsequently find out that the memory that they recovered was in fact false. So, you know, it's one thing to falsely remember a word. It's something else to falsely remember sexual abuse. But there seems to be a lot of evidence that even this level of memory can be um, false at times. And so this is an example, one, one example, my lie, a true story of false memory of somebody recounting, an author recounting a situation where she falsely accused a family member. Um, of horrific things based on what she latter found to be a false memory. So a really poignant thing to check out and, and to give you a sense of how big this can be. Um, here's the actual lists that, that I use to create those words. So if you want to try this with your friends, and plant some false memories just to show them it can and take what you've learned into the real world, that's cool. This is a website where you can actually try some more experiments of this sort. You can go through and do, and, and, um, do them. You may need a Java installed or something like that to make it work, um, but check it out. If you want to experiment more with your own memory or somebody else's, um, there's a good place to do it, a good tool to do it with. All right, cool. So now you have the idea of how that reconstructed memory process works. Um, and so now in the last half of this week, we're going to talk about a number of other issues related to memory, um, all stuff that's, that's really cool, you'll find fascinating, and I look forward to telling you about it. Have a good night. Bye-bye.